Uh, so first of all, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Alison has joined us, who's also a co-author of uh, the, the book, and, um, and, and John as well, of course, yeah, uh, who also has a chapter. Um, and yeah, it's, it's actually, you know, being the first live meeting we have of, of book authors, right? So, uh, second, it's, second live. Yeah, uh, we had we had the kind online of a, online one and a conference, and this one is hybrid uh, format. Yeah. So um, I don't know if somebody wants to start with some kind of insights or reflections on the talks we've heard today, um, or additions, yeah. or additions. John, Alison, since you haven't spoken yet, if you want to. Um, okay, I mean, just going back to what um, the question I posed to uh, Ali uh, was about, you know, going back to the new normal. And that's why I took, um, do you remember the 21 Motel com conference uh, on, you had as the, as the theme, hybrid learning spaces, a passing hype or a new normal. And I took that as, as the kind of research question for a course I teach at a uh, short course at go to university. Um, uh, I've done it once, run it once, and it's about to start again. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, it's provoked quite a lot of interesting questions. And what are, uh, in the business world, it's come up quite a lot. And there's like economic theories um, of hysteresis and things like that, which are kind of, kind of relevant to all of this. So. I mean, I think, you know, the pre-pandemic, pandemic, post-pandemic, post -pand the talk from Ale triggered all that for me, and as did the uh, uh, the title of that session in 21. And, and so I've, I've got a whole course out of it, and it, which is really good fun. The students, seem, I make sure I give examples from the chapter, and the students seem to like it, and they, they tend to be from everyday life, from a music course I did online, I'm a double bass player, and, um, and also my colleague, um, Debbie, which my interest in, she uh, was a, is at Bournemouth, and they had to go online with nurse nurse training, and it's a big medical. They're experts in their field, so I mean, you know, I think um, I found I find it very engaging just to think about these things and to think about them with my students, and that's why I'm here today. So that's me coming clean, uh, uh, you know. But it's um, it's quite nice having been a researcher for quite a few years to, to have students again who are quite engaged. Uh, I teach in English because my Germans, I can't speak German. So it's quite nice to keep, they keep re-employing me because uh, uh, I'm a retired, I'm retired essentially, but I'm a senior professor there. That's a, a post for, um, for retired professors, which is what I am. So, so I think this question, um, you know, you posed in the earlier thing of, um, you know, is what's the hype or is it a new reality? Are we going to go back to the old normal? There's a good toing and froing. We've, we've had this, I've been researching technology in Aslan for 20 years. And it's like, you know, you get the kind of Gartner, the, uh, the hype cycles and, you know, over, oh, we over egg it, we make too many promises. But is it, is it now the question is, is it, is it hype or is there, is there a change? Because, you know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's the question. And yeah, Tim, I'll give the foot. You seem to have something to say, go for it, mate. Thanks, John. I, I guess my point that I would want to make is I don't know why we always want to do one thing. So I don't know why we always we want to go back to classrooms or everyone has to. Well, I, I do know why everyone had to go online. That's a bit different. But, I don't. you know, why does everyone have to go hybrid? Um, why can't we do what suits the occasion you know so why can't we have all of these things available and then teachers with their teams and in their context can make informed decisions about the right approach um i do think ali's got a really good point that certain modes of teaching are very challenging and actually we're just not very good at them in general um i do think that they are possible because i've i've seen it happen but it's it's not easy so i guess my question is I can imagine hybrid or high flex being part of some kind of ongoing thing, but does it have to be everything? You know, can't we make decisions based on what, what's 
what's right for that context and the purposes and the values of the people involved. Yeah, well, yeah. If I, if I, can I agree with you. Actually. I mean, that's, sorry, go ahead, Alison. No, thank you. Um, yeah, if I could add to that, the, the chapter that Peter Goodyear and I worked on was actually talking about fluidity of ideas and the, the importance of interaction and actually using the learning spaces and the design for learning spaces to enable interactions with everything from primary school children writing letters through to university students learning how to become primary school teachers and exactly right that shift and the, the choreography, if you like, of the different blends of modes and uh, being aware that an artifact may operate as one with one function in one space and be repurposed in another space and very deliberately be repurposed again. So, so much I would come down to it, the importance of the learning design. So the epistemological approach, like you said, but then paying attention to how the set actually impacts on the social. So with all my um, excitement of work in hybridity, knowing that students do love it when it works, we actually did some very close linguistic analysis of the dialogic interactions that took place and noticed that our set was misfunctioning some of the time. We, we had kind of gone in with blinkers, think it was all going to be wonderful, and then realised that we had to take a step back again. So we're in that iterative phase now of looking very carefully at what's been made possible with the affordances. And absolutely, the students love the flexibility. I've, I've got about half my class off with COVID at the moment. and about a quarter of the rest of the class are saying, can we stay home and work too from our bedrooms? You know, um, But they, they recognise also that what's possible to do online is not the same as what's possible to do in the classroom. So quick anecdote, we were running a reader's theatre workshop today and the students in the room were able to move, interact with each other far more dynamically than those at home. Those at home were able to contribute, but it was very different. And so we were able to reflect on the differences of what occurred. So thank you for, for having me here today. It's actually 10 p.m. in Sydney, but it's lovely to be here with you. Uh, yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And, and yeah, we know it's, it's so well, you should be with a glass of wine now, right? But uh, um, okay. yeah, uh, so I, I think, you know, John, many years ago in London, there was this group uh, which I think you were part of, of, of user-generated contexts, yeah. right? And and even even there, I think there was this attempt to show to try to shift the focus from content to context. And I think you know, reflecting on what you said, Tim, the first step in sort of learning design is defining the context, right? And I'm going to create a sort of learning activity which would generate some, some, some experience for the learners. And first I need to think about what is the appropriate context for this activity. And then each context dictates what you can and can't do in terms of epistemology, social configurations, and so on. Now what's interesting here then, again, the whole idea about uh, hybridity is that we're intermixing different contexts and in a way, what we're doing is, is creating a new context. So when we have a context in which some of the students are here and some are there, it's, it's not this or that, it's not this and that, it's something completely new. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and I agree with Alison, it should be Antin, what, what works in, in a particular circumstance is best. I'm a complete um, uh, inter-Socratic dialogue, not, not entrapment as the original Socratic dialogue was and bringing Athenian slaves to tears and things like that. Uh, it was a, and, and dialogue goes through Matthew Lippmann, Vygotsky scaffolding and, and what I do face to face and, and I do that online and it just it does work actually. So you just got there's, there's a power imbalance in that. With the learner generated context group in London, yeah that was headed by Rose Luckin. So, uh, yes. and, uh, and the excellent Rose looking with Fred Garn and people like that. And what Rose also did is she's from an AI and education background, the same as me, my PhD was that. And I, I analyzed human dialogues, Alison, about, and I, met, I got into the, of how, to, how we learn to compose, because I've got a musical interest. And um, I was measuring the length of pauses and things like that. I really got, I went in deep, very deep, but it was very interesting. But I think, um, when you think about AI and now, and uh, Donald Clark's done some good books on how this can be used in training. That's I have a good debate with my students about the ethics of when it should and shouldn't be used. And then Donald Clark does bring this up. It's quite good at 
repetitive tasks, checking answers. It's not very good at lots of other things. So, you know, so we and having those debates, letting the students go off in rooms on their own so that I'm not there. So I don't get this power imbalance. My pedagogy comes from Vygotsky in particular, but with, with some Daniel's stuff on acti activity sets. So we get away from the power imbalance does seem to work online. And it's not just COVID, uh, the university at Frankfurt were very slow in getting contracts out because they cut the funding for the senior professors. Luckily I got through, but I've only just got my contract. So I'm teaching online again, because I couldn't get, get it together to go over there. I have been over there to teach, beautiful campus. But so I think going back to my original question, it is here to stay and not just for pedagogic reasons, but for structural reasons, which is why it was good to have um, Ali's um, perspective. I did try to push him on. Having worked for the VC's office, sometimes they can say, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Do they want to build buildings? Do they want to encourage the most flexible uh, workforce that's possible? But that means, as he says, that's they have to go into emergency training. I do know what our lesson plan is. I worked in further education and we did teacher training. So that was that was quite kind of lucky. You know, that was kind of a convoluted answer, you show, you know. You get value for money from me. <laughs> but but, but you, you, you're mentioning, and I think that's also wrote in the chat about, you know, the link between, you know, learning design and architecture, right? And, and that, that's, you know, that's what your thesis is. And, and you mentioned uh, a project that you're doing with the Ministry of Education these days on that. Maybe you want to, to tell us a word or two about that? Or? Um, it's, uh, it's actually, we are part of a, a grant from the, from the chief uh, science uh, in uh, the, the Ministry of Education. And we are a group of educators and architects that actually are trying to bridge the gap uh, between uh, space and architecture and create kind of a common language. So we all can um, actually design together uh, education and and a space that can support the um, actually the, the the vision of a school or a learning driven environment um, and we are working on this uh, black box let's say this dialogue this transformation from um, pedagogic qualities to space qualities and what, what, how, how do we create this black box actually we're trying to, uh, to work on that. So we all can, can, can talk uh, in the same language, understand uh, each other. Uh, I must say that uh, to collaborate with educators, uh, even though we all talk about collaboration, I talked also about collaboration, it's hard. Because the educators? Uh, no, <laughs> collaboration is hard. <laughs> collaboration is hard, that we know. Yeah, that much we know. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so we, we but have. Is, a... it, is it possible to find a common language between the educators and the architects? I mean, of course, yeah? we are working on it. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can. yeah, I can. Yeah, it will happen, I promise. Mm -hmm. I, I can add uh, another perspective to this uh, issue because uh, as COVID-19 uh, is continuing, we, it, it created opportunities uh, for collaboration. And uh, we have a, a collaboration, uh, I teach uh, uh, MED, Technology and Education, uh, here in Sionati uh, and we have a uh, an international course, uh, so collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues from Poland, from University of Dance uh, and in Technology. Uh, actually, they were part of, uh, for, for some time, they were uh, visiting or staying in, in this um, uh, event. So students from architecture, master degree, and students from education, master degree, creating learning spaces together, Bridging distances, uh, cultures, uh, disciplines, and um, way of thinking, and also some uh, with technology and without technology, and uh, we don't we're, we'll do it face to face among the the, the of course in some meetings like tomorrow, and but some some is only online. So 
it, it's challenging and really interesting related to the creating of language and, and mindsets, understanding and different roles and like bridging many uh, boundaries uh, in this respect. Okay, I, I want to I want to kind of throw, you know, we're, we're kind of it's late in the day, so maybe we need a, a sort of a slight provocation. Uh, maybe if you know reflecting on the last couple of years where we suddenly saw the idea of hybridity, you know, very dramatically moving from the fringes to center stage. What are the biggest mistakes? that you saw whether uh -huh. your own mistakes you know we can do this like uh i mean for a fail fest or there's a list uh you know, there's a saltier term for this or if you saw institutions without naming the institution or practitioners doing what are the biggest mistakes that you've seen in attempts to to go hybrid Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Without names. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just. Um, uh, you know, while talking about active learning and you know the, the teacher as a facilitator and uh, trying to create that you know the front of the classroom is not anymore the, the teacher wall and the, the board to write is not the teacher board. And, um, but then uh, came the hybrid situation and, um, and I started to see in classes that they put the speaker in the corner where the teacher was standing um, while uh, teaching, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the regular situation. And so and the camera, again, right? and the yeah. camera is exactly to the point where the teacher used to uh, stand. So again, we went, you know, we maybe added the technology, but we went back with the active learning and all the idea that the teacher can move from place to place in the, in the, in the classroom with physical space. So I think it's, it needs to be sensitive that we don't go uh, backward uh, uh, while we go forward. We need to correct the backwards because so many, like hundreds of classes uh, in the higher institution, hundreds and hundreds are, are in that uh, constellation. Microphone in the front and camera in the back, really conservative yeah. learning. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it starts from the fact that the person who designed the classroom uh, was an architect with a naive view of of teaching and they didn't have that dialogue with, with teachers like you're trying to do in your if they would have had a dialogue with educators and educators would say no i want to sit in the back and you know and i want everyone i want to move i want, to move. Move. I want okay. all the students in class to see all the students online and vice versa which I think here you got it right. I mean, you know, with the, with the different cameras. I, Tim, Tim is holding his hand up very politely, yeah. so perhaps uh, we'll let him speak. Well, it's very easy to hold this hand up. You don't get tired. <laughs> um, so I, I would say that the two main mistakes that I've seen are what we've just heard, which is that people try to do the same sort of thing as they did before or, or not rethink the premises that their teaching is based on. And the second one is that they think they can do whatever they want. Um, so we've already heard about the first one. The second one, for example, I did some um, hybrid teaching for the Edinburgh Futures Institute. And fortunately, I ran some practice um, workshops first and discovered that I wanted to do quite fluid group work that involved remote students and in room students and the design, you know, that I guess you would say the epistemic design was fine, I think, and the theory of the social design was fine and the theory of the set design was fine. But it didn't work because the sound was awful. And from people I've spoken to, the sound is the biggest problem with something like this. If you have one room 
and you have different groups of people talking and different channels of that noise going through um, online communication into remote students, you get crossover and, and you get noise suppression and, and you, you get, it, it was, it's a total mess. So actually you can't, you can't just do all these great designs. And so I think the lesson for me is you definitely have to test it out. It's so complex that you can't, you can't just assume that everything that you've taken account of everything and you have to do a design and then you have to try it out with, with friendly people. And then you have to be able to imagine what it will be like when you extrapolate it to the actual class. And then even then you need to be, you, you sort of need a, a plan that will help you adjust because um, if you discover at the time that, that things go off the rails, then you need to be able to change gears. But what I found was really helpful was getting the students onto your team so that they can help you reconfigure the design in a way that will work for them. So use the, the students as, a, as designers with you, get them on board, take time at the start to talk them through what you're trying to do and know and let them know that you don't know for sure that it's all going to work out but that you can reassure them by saying we'll all figure it out together but to do that then you have to lower the stakes a little bit as to how much are we going to get done during a session and that then comes back to what Ali was talking about thinking across not just the sessions but before and after the sessions so that if if not everything happens to plan during the session, you, you've got the kind of extended asynchronous design to, to mop th things up. So um, I think I went off topic a little bit, off question a little bit. <laughs> but, but, but you, you, you can, um, so in Toronto, you brought up a very interesting issue, which we hardly think about, and that is sound design. Yeah. So, I mean, we know this in, in online learning, right? That sometimes, you know, people can put up with fairly low video quality, but what really makes it difficult is if the audio quality is low, right? So, and, and when you think about hybrid learning spaces, you know, I think, you know, having a camera, which is somewhat, I mean, the camera here isn't that big, you know, high resolution, it's okay. But the good thing is we have a decent microphone, so we can move around. You know, we decided to move from that end of, of the class back here, and you can still um, hear us because there's a good microphone. And sound design is something that I think we don't pay a lot of attention, or not enough attention, and I think it's very difficult to get right. John, do you want to say something about that? Or Yeah, about sound, um, because one of the case studies in our chapter with Debbie Holly is on the jazz workshops that went online that I'm a part of uh, as, a, as a bass player, really. Uh, and um, these taught, the jazz workshops have got a big tradition in Bristol where I live in the UK. Uh, and uh, they, um, they always meet face to face in the back room of a pub or something, but they're very good with a proper tutor. But it's like, we are close to beer, uh, which is important for jazz musicians, as you can imagine. Uh, but when we went online, what we did was, Suddenly, the tutor, it's partly informal learning, partly formal learning, because the tutor does give you the, the score and you've got to go away. And so I was like, we were recording our bits, like I had to record the bass and put it, I'm, I've got a program, which is called Ableton, which you compile everything layer upon layer, and people would send me theirs. So the saxophone players had to record their sound to get a good sound. And one alto sax player, we had a real discussion about you know, microphones, what works, what doesn't. And this this is quite interesting. He found one of the saxophone players that he got the best sound if he recorded in his wardrobe. So he was like going into his wardrobe, recording his piece and doing it, doing it there. And we also got another guy who was recording his solo to, to send to me to, to put on layer on layer. And, and his son came into the room because he was working from home as well as doing this leisure thing. And he said, he was asking his dad a question and he kept doing his solo and, I and he pointed out uh, to the door and his son goes, why, why? But you can hear this on the recording of his solo because he <laughs> doesn't like that version. So, so we've got this, uh, which Peter Goodyear talks about, the uh, interpenetration of the, the physical, the digital, the leisure, uh, um, you know, home life, work life, 
I think that came out really well in those um, in that, that case study in particular, uh, but some hilarious anecdotes. But yeah, so we had lots of talks, techie talks about different microphones that you would work in different contexts, condenser mics, and the more, you know, the ones you put on walls and things like that to get a more general sound. Uh, I think they're important discussions, both for musicians and for generally capturing, I've got, you know, capturing what's going on if we are going to go hybrid, which I've never done high flex. I don't, I don't think I will. <laughs> The thing about musicians, yeah, you, you create a kind of a, a sterile space for recording. It might be your cupboard, but you know, you kind of, um, whereas, you know, we have a general space which is designed as, as a classroom, and now we want to break into groups and we want people from outside the room to listen to what's happening uh, and things right. It becomes a nightmare. We can very easily break into group work in just a Zoom or a team session, right? And we can very easily break into group work when everybody's in the room. What do we do when some people are here, some people are out, some people are synchronous, some asynchronous? I mean, it's, you know, this for me is, is really one of the big open questions. You know, how do we create a hybrid space that supports breaking up into groups, doing group work, coming back into a plenary, flowing between those social configurations, right? Um, and, and yeah, maybe that brings us just towards the end if, if everyone wants to state, you know, what do you see as kind of the biggest question, whether for practice or for research? Like, you know, if, if you want to sort of point in a direction when somebody, you know, this is where we should be looking, this is where we should be going, what, what do you see as the big questions going forward? I can say that uh, in our field, actually, um, the most uh, kind of uh, uh, interesting problem that we are going through now is related to what you say, uh, you said right now, is the acoustic. Um, it's not just the level of the speaker, but it is also the acoustic of those informal places that uh, we're trying to, to stay um, kind of a semi-open or, or open spaces and, uh, but still we need uh, some um, moments for um, concentrating uh, as a group and as individuals and, um, and how do we uh, create an acoustical solutions that can support these, those informal spaces. And I think this mm -hmm. is one of the, the most uh, uh, asked question now in the field of uh, designing learning spaces today. Yeah, for me, it's, yeah, for me it's, oops, um, uh, getting some feedback there. Um, it's how we design for, um, for bridging in the social context. So you've got these power imbalances in whether it's, you know, online, offline, or a mix of the two or whatever is going on. And, uh, because you get, you're getting this lack of mobility with people who can't afford access sometimes, or in lockdown, a lot of students who didn't get, uh, you, uh, you know, maybe, uh, I'm talking about school students, didn't have a, a space at home or a laptop. So how do we design for that kind of bridging to bring people in uh, so they get the same opportunities for, uh, and, you know, uh, as other people? Or how do we design for the kind of classroom situations or the hybrid situations online offline to go seamlessly not just in terms of the microphones but in terms of uh, the power imbalances when someone like me say now i'm dominating but i do mute my mic and i try and pull back but these these how do we design to give people that kind of equity of access to to, to learning that's a big uh, question for me I'd like to add uh, two, two areas. Uh, one that I, I have the sense, I'm, I'm not, uh, well, it's not uh, evidence-based, but that possibly uh, the technology and also acoustic design uh, would, uh, would come, come up as a disruptive uh, innovation that would change some of what we can do in the future. So this is just my, thoughts and uh, because 
with different acoustic, with different technology that makes the presence of the students from afar here in the class. Things will be different if, uh, for teachers. Uh, it will be much, much easier uh, to plan. So th this is one area. And the second is uh, looking at the cell, uh, SEM, uh, of this is of our life, of student life, and how we can bridge and make things easier to, to those students who are in quarantine and can come or wouldn't come. And so this is a, it's an area I think that we get the- So uh, as in social emotional learning. Yeah, social emotional learning. So Alison, you want to say about bringing colleagues on board, maybe you want to elaborate on oh, that? Just, just very briefly, I mean, my comment above was I'm thinking about the dynamism of dealing with the acoustics. So for me, you know, you can have all manner of microphones in the room and camera set up and um, interactive whiteboards, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the dynamism that you try and have in a lesson, like Tim was saying before, of shifting from one interactive mode to another. And that's complex enough for somebody who's keen on education. I've been working in this space for a very long time, but my colleagues who see themselves as content experts and not uh, education experts, for me, the biggest challenge is how can we, how can we build the affordances in, but in such a way that they can also learn about them? Because basically at some stages during these lessons, it's like operating a mixing desk using John's analogy of the, of the musician, the recording, and your average, sorry, your average, that somebody not um, with an education background, for them, it's just, you know, it's a journey too far. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. I mean, all of us here today are people who are very passionate about these issues, obviously. The, you know, 2,800 people who downloaded the book are obviously interested in this as, as a subject, you know, John, your students are taking a course on hybrid learning because they're interested in that as a subject domain, but when we talk about broader faculty, you know, they're, they're experts in their knowledge domain and they just want to get through. I think we need to find a way to make it easier for them, to, to actually make it easier for them to get things done within the sort of the active collaborative hybrid uh, context that we're talking about than it would have been otherwise, right? And, Yes, and, and we do need to wrap up. Um, if if anybody from from the audience who's ever left from the audience uh, <laughs> wants to kind of open their microphone, their camera, say something before we wrap up, now is the time or forever hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, uh, for speaking, for uh, listening, uh, for sharing ideas. Uh, it was a really a joyful time together. And I think uh, how we're learning is here to stay. So I think we, we should plan the next uh, event together. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and thank you for the panelists and for all the speakers. And I had to leave early. We'll leave the, the Zoom room open for a few more minutes, but you know, I'll I'll close the recording and you know yeah. we'll all get our water now or coffee, whatever. Oh wine. Oh wine, yes. Yeah.